Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Law Preview Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is September 20th, 2019. Okay, before we get too far along, you have responsibilities as a viewer, and that's to like the show, to comment on the show. So far, we have like 100 comments on the last program we did. That's wonderful. That's where the conversation continues. And we're having a law discussion here, and you're going to want to go to the comments and ask questions and put down your opinions and keep the conversation going. If you're not subscribed to the program yet, you can subscribe on YouTube. You just go to the very bottom there. You're going to see that little red rectangle that says subscribe. Click it. And then a little bell comes up. Click the bell because that would give you an instant notification the second we post another video. I have Alan Haley. We haven't had Alan Haley in a while. Alan? Here is my latest email from last Friday. It doesn't say, Kevin, great show. It says, Kevin, is something wrong with Alan? I went to the website, the curmudgeon website. He hasn't posted anything in a long time. And I don't want to tell people that you're allowed to take vacations and you have an air stream and you travel the world. Uh, tell people what you, your newest hobby and how oh, it's a 20-foot long silver tube. 22 feet. Yeah, an air stream sport, and it's... Uh... It's a marvelous way to get out of things and go places you've never seen before. You're out of all reach of telephone and communication. You're up in the nature it's with lots of other good people camping and enjoying the hikes and the views, especially the views. And you've tried, but there's just no way to get a broadband signal good enough uh, to <laughs> no. do shows with breaking news. And that's okay. You have Even earned the right to have vacations <laughs> now and then. Even the latest, fanciest, newest airstreams have only a 4G network, so oh, that's I wouldn't be it. wouldn't carry it. <laughs> no. So let's talk about the three news topics that have appeared in the news in the last two months. Uh, South Carolina seems to have a good plan B on how to uh, I don't want to say sue for assets, but collect well, for the value of the property <clears throat> improvements since uh, it they've taken over. Right. Let's um, review quickly for viewers who maybe have forgotten the, the mess that was left in South Carolina by the Supreme Court's decision. Um, once um, Kay Hearn, Justice Kay Hearn, uh, recused herself, that left it uh, two to two. And for some reason, the Chief Justice did not avail himself of a statute that says that when the panel's less than five, you can apply to the governor to appoint a special judge. He didn't do that. I don't know why, but it left it two to two. And it means uh, when it went back to the lower court for further uh, proceedings in light with the decision, there really wasn't anything, of, um, three of them as a majority, had voted on that for the lower court to follow. Now, only two of them, including Justice Hearn, had voted to say that the Dennis Cannon uh, applies here. And the Chief Justice said, well, the Dennis Cannon will apply to all those churches who signed on to it. Well, there hadn't been any evidence of which churches had signed on because that wasn't an issue in the case. And they simply assumed without a, a figure taken from the Episcopal Church's brief that 24 churches had, uh, had quote, signed on to the Dennis Canon. I mean, if you can't figure it out, just ask the Episcopal Church. Episcopal They'll Church. tell you who may have implied that they wanted to sign, right? <laughs> exactly. So that's what this judge has been struggling with. He's How can he apply... The decision that says if they've signed on when there's no evidence in the record as to who actually subscribed to the Dennis Cannon in, in so many words and all that. Anyway, um, as a counter strategy, uh, the plaintiffs in that case, a member of Bishop Lawrence had been instigated to lawsuit as a defensive measure. Um, the plaintiffs filed a, a, also a suit called under the Betterment Statute. And when you, under the Betterment statute, it's when you have a property that you've used for a long time and you spend a lot of money on it and you've improved it, then someone comes along with superior title to yours and says, hey, this is really my property, uh, and they take it over, then the law allows you to say, well, okay, but here's all this money I spent on improving it. Well, and you're going to now get a windfall from that. So it's an anti-windfall statute. It's a great little device. And this would be a huge windfall to the Episcopal Church in South Carolina many, if they got all these properties. Many states have this written into law. Now, does the windfall come before the property was built? I mean, 
the church, do we say the land is uh, ground zero and yeah. then we built the church on it. And right. so you have to pay us the value of the church and everything inside the, the church. And we the put granite car countertops next to the altar. You know, we did all these upgrades so that $14 million church you have to pay us for. That's the betterments. Yeah, exactly. How did you better the property mm -hmm. by adding value to it? Hmm. And that's what that's taking the windfall away. So it's uh, at, particularly for Camp Christopher, which is their uh, main recreational facility. They put a lot of money into that place. And uh, that was another funny thing in the court decision, because it wasn't clear, again, which justices had awarded Camp Christopher, that the Chief Justice mentioned it in, in a footnote, but not in a dispositive way. And so with Kay Hearns recusing herself, there was only the vote of Justice Placonis to say that uh, the Camp Christopher went to uh, the Episcopal Church. So this is a real major mess, and the justices made it their own mess and refused to clean it up and passed, kicked it on down the road. And so now this poor judge in, in South Carolina is having to deal with it all. I admire his tenacity, but it's taking him a, a very long time. And of course it would, because he's got to sort out all these issues where he has to have new factual hearings or whatever. Anyway, the strategy for the betterment so far, he, he allowed that to claim to proceed over the Episcopal Church's objections. So now the Episcopal Church knows that if it gets these properties, it's gonna to have to pay a pretty penny for them. Hmm. Well, that's, it's good news, bad news. What's mm -hmm. the, the best outcome in this, then? Well, <clears throat> the best outcome, as I say, would be a, um, uh, a reading of the decision and a close parsing of it that says, all right, if a church signed onto the Dennis Canon, then uh, it will be d deemed to have gone to that property, but there will have to be a factual examination of every case, and we'll have to see an actual consent, not, none of this implied consent from saying that we agree to abide by the canons of the Constitution of the Episcopal Church in because 1960. Because South Carolina, in a court decision, says the Dennis Canon does not apply right. to South our state. Yeah, and that decision was not overruled. Mm -hmm. And so um, they can't apply it automatically the way Dennis Cannon likes to be applied. Mm -hmm. They have to show that they willingly agreed to put a trust on. That would be the best outcome because it was, I don't think any church in South Carolina you know, could fall under that no, category. Willingly, willing putting their properties in trust for the Episcopal Church. Uh, and the other factor here is to sorting out which diocese is which diocese because these churches are all members of Bishop Lawrence's diocese. And if they, the Dennis County, if you remember, puts parish property in trust for the diocese and the Episcopal Church. So the diocese is a co-trustee. And of course, the upstart diocese that was started after Bishop Lawrence and his diocese withdrew, then claimed to be the heir of all these things. But they're not the same legal entity. They weren't around when the churches were built. And were, and these churches still consider themselves members of Bishop Lawrence's diocese. Did, so, didn't Bishop Lawrence give all the churches a quick claim deed? He uh, did four years ago, three years ago. He did exactly. Has that worked at all? Well, that is, you know, the only thing they could overcome that would be a signing on of the Dennis Canon because mm -hmm. uh, it would release the diocese's claim to the property, but not the Bishop Church's claim. Hmm. Yeah, they're not going to give a quick claim deed. <laughs> <laughs> all right for the entirety of anglican unscripted all 535 episodes the Epis the episcopal church in texas has been uh, in court stalling uh the diocese of fort worth diocese of uh mm -hmm. dallas fort worth and so we have some news yes they're finally going to trial <laughs> right well once it, what you remember what happened was it went up to the supreme court the first time they reversed the decision below that it awarded everything to the Episcopal Church, sent it back for a new trial without, um, under neutral principles of law, right. so it has to look at the contracts. And again, the Dennis Cannon doesn't carry any weight in Texas. Uh, so they had to prove it by, again, co trust documents and contracts. And they got a judgment this time in favor of them saying, yeah, the um, Diocese of Fort Worth is the one that through its corporation holds title to all these properties. Well, then it went up on appeal, and the appellate court took two years or more to wrestle with this thing. One judge finally ended up publishing a 150-page opinion, and she came down at the end and concluded that the, um, the new diocese, the upstart diocese created by the Episcopal Church after Bishop Iker's diocese had withdrawn, um, was the successor to the trust. 
of the of the corporation of, of the of the diocese so therefore it was the one who had the ability to name the trustees for the corporation and um so that's now gone back up to the texas supreme court again both sides took an appeal and um uh, the Texas Supreme Court has now recently agreed to hear the case again and pronounce it as they're going to probably take oral arguments, I understand, in December. And so then we will have finally, a, a few months after that, a definitive decision as to which trust is the real trust in, in uh, Texas. Best case scenario. Best case scenario is that they find for Bishop Eichers Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, which has the original trustees appointed by the uh, original diocese and find that the upstart group has no standing and that those people are not validly elected as trustees. And it's a pretty straightforward application of under neutral principles of trust law because the Episcopal Church, as usual, just wants to wave its wand and say, hey, Abracadabra, we are now the um, trustees here because you're no longer qualified to serve in the Episcopal Church. Well, that was the point of our withdrawing, frankly. But <laughs> <laughs> They're like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we should dodge that bullet. <laughs> All and right. you can you can see what's happening in the Episcopal Church because we've got all three stages now. We've got South Carolina that withdrew, uh, Texas that still is in between waiting for a court decision approving, and then we've got Albany where they haven't withdrawn and their bishop's now in trouble. Well, let, let's talk about Bishop Love. Here's a bit of trivia. The first consecration that I ever filmed for Anglican TV was Bishop Love's uh, oh. in Albany. Uh, uh, Bishop Duncan was there at the time, uh, lots of conservative, uh, Anglican communion type uh, uh, um, bishops. Uh, Bishop Duncan did not dress in clerics because he didn't want he didn't want to be on stage with Frank Griswold and clerics at the time. They, this was the, the beginning of the, of, of the war. Mm -hmm. So Bishop Love and I go way back, and I've watched him struggle to hold the line. Now, let me back up a little bit. One of my favorite books is Catch-22, ah. where your Sarian has flown all the missions he, he thought he needed to fly, they keep raising the missions, and he wants to quit. And they said, you can quit and fly home and be discharged if you're crazy. Oh, I'm crazy. <laughs> well, actually, if you're crazy, you're not crazy if you want to leave because a crazy person would obviously, you know. So that was just Catch-22. Bishop Love seems to be in this catch-22 because when he signed on, he, uh, the marriage in the Episcopal Church was only heterosexual. Right. Uh, there were none of these extra amendments from General Convention. He vowed to uphold the doctrine and discipline of the, the Episcopal Church as it then was. Yeah, and he also is bound by the prayer book, the rubrics of the prayer book. The prayer book. You know, the doctrine really hasn't changed. No. If I, if I understand... Cared. They haven't dared to do it yet. They're they're working up to it. They can't do it. So when I see that they really want to take him to Title IV, I'm like, need to talk to Alan. Yeah. Okay, what's going to happen? This is one of those travesties that started under uh, Bishop Shorey, Jeffrey Shorey, and has now continued, for better or for worse, under Bishop Curry, uh, presiding Bishop Curry, because it's basically a legalistic argument that says, uh, when you sign on to the discipline, doctrine and discipline of the Episcopal Church, then you sign on to everything that comes after you sign on. And regardless of whether you agree with what General Convention does or not, if it's an act by General Convention, you have to respect it. Well, the problem here is that the, not even General Convention can override the rubrics of the prayer book, except by amending the prayer book. And that's a two-year, two-convention process, yeah, six, six years. Six years, six years, yeah. Yeah, and so to go through that process and change the rubrics and so right now, Bishop Love can say, I'm following the rubrics, which are higher than the canons. Uh, rubrics take precedence over the canons because you can change the canon in a one session of general convention. But prayer book and constitution both require two sessions of general convention. And they did that for a reason, obviously, because they want certain things not easy to change. And so this is going to be interesting. It's, it would go to a hearing panel, which will be five bishops I'm sorry, four bishops, I think, and a layperson from uh, the Diocese of West Texas. And um, so it's going to, uh, or one clergy, I'm sorry, and three oh, bishops. Clergy, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, then um, it's going to, the panel will be chaired by um, 
Bishop Nisley of Rhode Island, who's a very fair-minded person. And he's going to have to resolve this issue in some way because uh, it has to come down to which takes precedence, the rubrics of the prayer book or the uh, canons of general convention. And it was, um, I put, as I, I wrote a post on this, I remember when it first came up, and I included a link to a video, maybe it's still online, of the convention where they adopted this resolution B12 that he's now charged with violating. And he questioned a, the panel recommending the thing about, is this ob going to be obligatory on all dioceses? And uh, does this word mean that we all have to subscribe to it? And they said, well, no, there's some wiggle room in there. No, there were, a fight broke out too. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, were, they were arguing back and forth over that. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, he was told the wrong thing when they put it up for adoption. He's not been treated fairly anywhere in this process, and this is the latest thing. So I'm hopeful that uh, the hearing panel, and if not the hearing panel, then it'll go up on appeal. It's going to have to be decided ultimately and as to which has precedence. And if you, of course, the Episcopal Church has no trouble ignoring its constitution. Uh, well, and pre presiding, this, bishop, this case, presiding Bishop Curry is not Catherine Jefferts Shorey. No. I don't think at the end of the day he wants to make a martyr out of Bishop Love. Do you think, though, is, uh, I, I don't know on the latest of the who the legal counsel is at uh, yeah, the Episcopal Church. Yeah. I think David Boothbeers may have retired by now, but if not, it, and it, his um, deputy, pre he used to work with all the time, Mary, um, uh, if it's case, 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 case. Me. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, she's, uh, I think, still in there in the legal affairs. And so if they're allowed to run things, they are going to, you know, basically mess things up like this and make a, a mishmash of which is a canon and which is a rubric. Um, so it really requires some uh, people to stand up in the Episcopal Church and say, wait a minute, we all fo follow the laws here. We have our canons, we have our rubrics, and we have our constitution. And there's a clear hierarchy there. I wonder if we're going to be embarrassed again by the Anglican Communion partner bishops who last time uh, there were charges and uh, allegations brought against Love didn't say a word. I know. You know. I know. This is, uh, they're leaving him to stand on his own. And it's, um, yeah, they're all embarrassed by it. They have to be. And now this is, they're, they're, because this is, this case is squarely presents the issues. I say you can have arguments about the discharging of the other bishops when uh, Bishop Jefford Shorey said, "Boom, you're out of here because you wrote a nasty letter," um, and I don't need any more proof. <laughs> and then and the canons, schmanons, you're you're just out of here. And if we don't have the votes because we don't have the proper majority in the House of Bishops, it still doesn't matter. They voted you out. <laughs> and she, you know, she's the only. Bishop, I had to write about having violated five canons in the same on the same weekend. day. Yeah, it was yeah, the same right. weekend. Just like, <laughs> I was tried for six. I just couldn't <laughs> violate six. I did five. But thanks, Catherine. Yeah, <sighs> and so, and as you say, Curry's a different um, color, a little milder and softer. But I, I hope he's not influenced too much by the legal counsel that guided Bishop Shepherd Shorey for so long. Yeah. Well, he, I mean. He showed up at the this uh, thing they had at Lambeth a couple of years ago in January, where they had the uh, there wasn't a uh, primates oh. meeting; it was a primates committee gathering, mm -hmm. and he had completely convinced Justin that all the problems he was having was with the Orthodox A A N C A C N A here in America, and he wasn't uh -huh. problem at all. And when they raised this with uh, Bishop Foley, Archbishop Foley said, "Really, stop suing us." That's all yeah. I got to do. You know, if, yes. if you want to be the good guy, stop suing us. <laughs> right, right. And all the money that's been wasted over the last 20 years in courts, just, it's amazing. $60 million is my guess, and probably counting even more now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all just right. astounding. Best case scenario for Bishop Love? Uh, that he is upheld, and that they say, uh, if, if General Convention wants this to be mandatory in every diocese, same-sex marriage, they're going to have to amend the prayer book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to. But, I mean, in the end, they don't have and to And by then, Bishop Love will have retired. <laughs> but they don't have to honor their constitution. They did, you know, they've they broken those rules in the past. Exactly. And yet they still can't make him. I don't think even if they, you know, if they discipline him, they're just going to say, 
uh, either allow same-sex marriages in your diocese or will depose you. And then they'll go through the charade of a vote in the House of Bishops where they won't have the requisite number of bishops attending to form a quorum to depose a bishop, but they won't care about that. The challenge will go just like it did with uh, with Bishop Duncan when they threw him out. They didn't have the requisite number of votes there present to vote a majority, but that didn't stop them and they just uh, went ahead and voted anyway. So he'll have the vote by these colleagues of his. And yet with every vote they take like that, they just get more and more despicable because they are not following their own rules and they're d doing shortcuts for convenience. And that, you know, can lead to no nothing good. Nothing good ever comes out of illegality because it, it creates a bunch of nullities that people are entitled to disregard. And if you have to stand on principles, you have to disregard them. So it's a, um, it's a willful destruction of the order of, and discipline of the Episcopal Church. There ought to be charges brought against these people for undermining the canons and discipline of the Episcopal Church. Talk about not following their vows. These are the people who aren't following their vows. That's true. And they could be disciplined for what they're not doing, but nobody would, nobody's going to charge them. Yeah. You know, the, into the canons are written uh, <laughs> articles for ta you know, taking care of the bad people in the church, and they're completely ignored. They take away the last conservative. The token right. conservative is going to be kicked out. Yeah, it's, I, I did a column on that once called uh, in, the, in the Land of the Canon Eaters, mm. based on a, a um, Tennyson's poem, okay. The Lotus to Lotus Eaters. In the show notes, I'm going to link to Alan's blog. Are you, now, you're clearly you know halfway into retirement now. You own an <laughs> RV. That's, that's halfway there. Are you going to be adding to your blog anymore, or what's, what's up with that? I'm trying to um, come to terms with that because I'm not writing about the Episcopal Church hardly anymore because mm -hmm. it's just it's beneath contempt. And it, I get Amen. no, I get neat, no pleasure out of chronicling its its sour uh, decline into into dismal, you know, turpitude. It's sort of a. Um, it's a United so Nations of. I, uh, I was an Anglican curmudgeon when I started, and I suppose I can go back and. But you know, Bishop, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury is no fun to write about either, because he's such a sop and and a, a spineless guy. And he's going to have his Lambeth convention. I don't know. Maybe I'll put something up about that. But this Anglican curmudgeon is going to have to find something else to be a curmudgeon about because it hasn't. None of that really you know, gets the blood broiling anymore. Okay. <laughs> it used to be. Uh, let me boil your blood. <laughs> the main topic, according to Justin Welby, of Lambeth 2020 is climate change. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> they can't do too much damage with the, the, the doctor of the church. Talk about fiddling while Rome burns. <laughs> <sighs> well, yeah. Alan, I do want to thank you for your time. Uh, you can just send the invoice to Anglican TV. We'll, we'll pay the, the legal charges here. <laughs> yeah, but, that's right. You know, <laughs> but thanks again. It's good to have you back on the program. Good thank to see you. you well. Thank you. Good to check in with you. We'll uh, make it not so long next time. Yeah, okay. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Alan Haley. And you've been watching episode 535, the legal edition of Anglican Unscripted. That's the total number of senators and representatives in the Congress. Very good. 535. That's right. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Puerto Rico. One for each of them. <laughs>